Uh, last week, in case you missed it, let me recap briefly. Um, last week we kicked off what is going to be a fairly short series looking at obedience to God. And we asked the question of, of whether we can trust God or not. We learned that obedience is a choice that we make when we don't want to do something, right? And sometimes, or maybe even oftentimes, God wants something for us, but it requires us to do something we don't necessarily want to do. But you see, God always wants what is best for us, but the question is, do we trust Him in that? And here's the hard truth. Any time that I disagree with God, I'm wrong, right? Because He knows what's best for me. So we have to learn to trust Him. You see, trust is a difference maker. It makes or breaks a relationship. So now you are all caught up in case you missed last week. And you can always, of course, watch the sermons online. I try to post them ideally by noon on Monday, but at the very most by Monday evening. So if you miss a week, you can stay on pace. Now today we're going to examine the following question. What if God wants something that seems impossible, right? What if God, what if God wants something in my life that, that seems to be impossible? I mean, what if God wants me to break up with my boyfriend or my girlfriend, but I've been with him for years? Or, or what if God wants me to change careers, even though I'm well established and the bills are being paid and not everything's, you know, too bad at what I'm already doing? Or, or what if God maybe wants me to admit my secret sin, that thing that I've been covering, that thing I've been carrying, that thing that I've been hiding for so long, I couldn't stand to have anybody know, right? What if, what if God wanted me to start giving of my time, my treasures, and my talents? What if God wants me to forgive someone who's hurt me deeply? What if, what if God wants me to not quit on my marriage so He can heal it? What if God wants me to share my faith even though I am shaking in my boots afraid to tell somebody about Jesus? You see, when what God wants from us seems impossible, it's easy to begin to think that obedience then is voluntary. But here's something I've learned. God loves us way too much to let us stay comfortable. A few years ago, I was uh, at, at a park. We were, used to live in Waseca, and there was a park just down the road from uh, where we lived. It was uh, very convenient to go there, and it was the biggest park in town with multiple playground sets. It was a very convenient thing. And so I was down there with my son, Justice, and he was, he was clamoring and climbing and running and playing and having his fun. And uh, as I was sitting there, and it was, it was about this time of year, maybe a little more towards summer, we'll see, I don't remember, but... Uh, he, we, were, we were there just playing, having fun, and I was sitting on a picnic bench, kind of near uh, the large parking area. And, and for the most part, that parking lot wasn't used a whole lot. And, and what you'd often find were, that was where a lot of parents would bring their young children to learn how to ride bicycles. And so this happened to be the case on this particular day. There was this just adorable, I don't know how else to put it. She was so cute, just just you know, little blonde. She, she had the bicycle helmet on, so, and she had the elbow pads on, and she had the knee pads on. And if there were more pads, she probably would have worn them, but that's all that they had. And then she had the cute little blonde braided pigtails coming out of either side of the helmet, right? And, and everything was pink and shiny and sparkly. And she had the whole setup. She had the horn, right? She just, just the, you, you can picture this. this. This young, I'm guessing, five, maybe six-year-old young little lady and her dad, and, and they're down there, as, as I could see quite readily, to, to learn how to ride this bicycle. And, and it's fairly quiet, so I can hear their interactions pretty clearly. And uh, I hear this child, after, after they get everything loaded onto the, out of the truck and onto the parking lot and all the pads on and ready to go, the child says, Dad, can't we just go and get the trike? Right? No, 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 honey, you're going to learn to ride your bike. But I don't want to ride a bike. I don't need to ride a bike. I already know how to ride a trike. I like my trike, right? No, we're going to learn how to ride the bike today. Riding bikes is dumb, Dad, right? I mean, she, she's very assertive about that. 
And she just starts screaming at some point in the middle of this, right? And I'm sure this poor dad, uh, every parent has been there where your child is screaming and you're thinking everybody must be thinking you're abusing the child, but you're not, right? And so the girl's just like screaming for a few minutes and just raging to the point at which she starts crying and buckles her helmet and throws it across the parking lot. Okay, well, at this point, you're beginning to wonder about the dad's makeup, right? And he just quietly plods over, dusts off that helmet, picks it up, walks back over, puts it back on his daughter's head, and he just keeps repeating, just do what I tell you, and you'll be fine. And I've heard him, by, the, by this point, he said this to her just encouragingly, like 20 or 30 times, just do, honey, just, honey, just do what I tell you, and you'll be fine, just do it, just give it a try, just do what I'm telling you, you will be fine, you can do this, he's, he's been encouraging her along the way. She begins to realize, dad's not going to quit, until we give this a go, and she kills herself riding the bicycle, so, she looks at him finally, after he puts his helmet back on, whatever you do, daddy, don't let go. That's all she says. Whatever you do, Daddy, don't let go. I, I will try. I will ride as long as you hold on and hold me. So they try. And he, he, he of course, dutifully holds on to the back of the seat and then and kind of chases her around as she wobbles along. As you've seen, if you've ever seen somebody, it's like watching a, a new deer stand up when that kid is trying to you know, ride the bike. It just wiggles and wobbles everywhere for the first couple of tries, right? But after about five tries, she started to pedal along the way here, and she started to stabilize and straighten out a little bit. And, 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 and I've noticed that every time they go, they go a little bit faster. And Dad's gone from a very, very slow walk to, to, to almost a light little jog, because this girl's already starting to get the hang of it, and she's starting to move a little bit. And so on like the sixth try, finally, she starts pedaling, and as you know, as you pedal, it creates a gyroscopic force, and it makes it actually easier to ride if you go a little bit faster. And so. All of a sudden, she straightens out, and she starts going fast enough. She just starts pulling away from Dad. And pretty soon, she's like halfway across the parking lot before she even realizes she's left Dad in the dust. And when she realizes it, she just about eats it, right? But, but she manages to recover and, and, and make a turn and ride back to, all the way back to Dad. Just big old grin, you know? Smile as wide as her face. What an amazing thing to observe. Now, ladies and gentlemen, God is calling us, and he's going to keep calling us to higher and higher things, because on the other side of obedience, it's always a blessing. The little girl didn't know how much she was going to enjoy this at first. She fought it tooth and nail. And by the time she had figured out what Dad already knew, she was grinning ear to ear, right? And so much is so true oftentimes with us as well. And, and the truth of the matter is, on the other side of obedience, when that blessing comes, oftentimes the only way we can get to that blessing is by going through what God has in store for us. And that can be frightening. That brings us to point number one, of course. Fear is normal. When God calls you to do something great, when God calls you to do something out of the ordinary, when God calls you to do something that challenges you, that stretches you, it's normal to have fear. And it's easy to believe that you have to overcome that fear in order to obey God. Because it feels like, like scared obedience might not count, right? Like, like, if you think of all the stories of our heroes and all of our leaders, of course, you, you hear these stories throughout time of, of fearless men and women and their, their great courage, of course, and their boldness. But we know that's not always true, right? And in fact, if you read your Bible, the, the, some of the greatest, in fact, most of the greatest acts of faith and courage were accomplished by ordinary men and women, just like you and me. Men and women who, who were balancing both faith and and fear at the very same time. And when failure feels like a very real possibility, it can be hard to trust God. And the Bible is filled with stories of, of men and women who chose to obey God, even though 
They were unsure what the outcome might be. Remember Moses, right? In the Old Testament? Moses practically begged God to send somebody else to Pharaoh, right? Not me. I'm not a good speaker. No, somebody else, God. Elijah, if you remember his story, he wasn't afraid to take on the 400 prophets of Baal, but he feared a woman by the name of Jezebel, right? Remember that? And as you might know, there's not necessarily any rhyme or reason to our fears. But make no mistake at all about it. Fear is real. And obedience can be scary. If you don't have some doubts, in fact, you're probably playing it a little bit too safe. Jesus once used the example of a mustard seed. You might remember that parable. He used the example of the mustard seed to describe the kind of faith it takes to experience miracles. Jesus says this in Matthew 13 and 31 and 32. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and he sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all of the garden plants, and it becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, I don't think he was trying to quantify faith here. I, I believe that he was trying to give permission for us to act. When fear feels like a tidal wave, when faith feels small, maybe as small as a mustard seed. And mustard seed moments are those small, seemingly insignificant acts of obedience that can start a domino effect to lead to mighty miracles. When, when knowing the final outcome would actually paralyze us. But, but hopefully you will be able to muster enough crazy faith to take that first one itty bitty tiny small step. And I can promise you, as you begin to take those little mustard seeds steps of faith, as you take those little steps of faith to obey what God wants, I promise you, you will be filled with adrenaline and fear. And it might be something as small as sharing your faith with a coworker or a neighbor, or maybe it's getting on a plane to fly to the Dominican Republic this coming December, or, or it could be any act of of obedience that requires courage. But when you do what God wants, even if you're not sure that you can do it, even if you are scared, all you need is enough faith to take that first little step to get started. Zechariah 4.10 says, For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin we got to get it started. It's called faith for a reason, right? Faith takes trust. Trust God. Trust that He is and He will be for you. You might be scared, but do it anyhow. Do it scared, whatever He calls you to. Second thing in your notes, if you're taking notes, is this amazing idea. We know this, but we need to articulate it. God knows my potential, right? God knows my potential. I I was blessed with some amazing coaches growing up. Some, Some people who invested enormously in me over the years. People who looked at me and saw things in me that I had no idea were there. And they pushed me to get to places that on my own I would have never gotten to. Right? Many of you probably have had a similar experience in life. Let's talk about a man by the name of Gideon. You've probably heard of him before. Gideon was a man who, who experienced the thrill and the fear of obeying God. And you see, Gideon was, a, was an answer to some people's prayer. God's people were starving at the hand of their enemies. And so they cried out to the Lord, it says. And so God decided that Gideon would be their answer. And it's, it's crazy to consider that your obedience could actually be the answer to someone else's prayer. You ever thought of that? By being obedient, you 
could be the answer to someone else's prayer? What if God is asking you to do a miraculous thing that is an answer for somebody else? And all it takes is a little faith to take that first step. I want to read to you something that is crazy in Judges. It starts in 16.12. There it says, That the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Speaking to Gideon. And now here's why that's so crazy, right? If we go back and we read the verse that comes right before this one in 6.11, Judges 6.11 says this, It says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Oprah, which belonged to Joash and the clan of Abenezer. And then you need to know that Gideon, the son of Joash, he was there, but he was threshing some wheat. And where was he? At the bottom of a wine press to hide. So imagine this. An angel of the Lord shows up with a message from God, and Gideon's hiding. Why would God call someone a mighty hero when they were hiding in fear? Maybe like Gideon. Maybe you feel like hiding sometimes, right? Life has just beaten all the creativity and all the courage out of you. And you just feel like you maybe just want to be left alone. And that's kind of how Gideon felt too. But the angel's words to Gideon reminds us that who you are now is not who you will always be. And how you see yourself now is not at all how God sees you. See, God is able to look into our future and see the mighty warrior that we will become, even though at the moment we might feel like a miserable failure, just like Gideon. You see, Gideon Gideon wasn't convinced that he was the man for the job. And every time I read stories in the Bible, I wonder why God doesn't just call on more confident people, right, to do these things that are so difficult sometimes. Why does God keep calling on these insecure, unqualified people to do these impossible things? I think the reason for it is, and I'm convinced of this, that God uses two kinds of people. And the two kinds of people that God uses are the humble and then those that He humbles. You see, there's a a fine line between belief in our own abilities and then underestimating the needs for God's supernatural abilities. And God's aversion to pride often leads Him to use people who doubt themselves. And maybe, just maybe that's where you feel like you might be right now in some place in your life and faith. You're doubting yourself. You've doubted your ability to obey what God wants you to do. You're having trouble to muster up mustard seed faith to obey something that seems impossible. But don't ever forget, God calls us to be mighty warriors. Yeah, maybe you're hiding out right now, but God can see who you will become if you will step out in faith. Maybe right now you feel like a failure as a mom because your kids have been going crazy and God calls you a mighty mom. Maybe maybe you feel addicted and bound and freedom feels like it will never be an option. God doesn't call you addicted. He calls you free. Maybe you've even failed in the past, right? God called you, but you didn't answer. You let fear win. Our God is the God of second chances. And He'll keep coming and keep ringing and keep giving you opportunities to be obedient and faithful. Your past does not have to define your future. You can't drive down the road looking in the rear view mirror, folks. God wants to do great things with you and through you. And He will give you another chance if you failed in the past. If you are willing to be obedient and faithful. Are you understanding me? Point number three. Miracles can happen for the bull. So after arguing with this angel, Gideon finally agrees that 
And he has this mustard seed faith moment. You see, God tells him to go and tear down the altar that his father had made to the false god Baal. Gideon had no idea what God was going to ask next. And if he had, he probably would have quit at that point. But you see, that's not how God often works. You see, God leads us. He calls us. He nudges us to take another little step towards his plan. And only after we obey, only after our faith muscle grows a little bit, only then are we able to see what that next step might be. So Gideon agrees to tear down this altar. But he doesn't do it as a mighty warrior. Judges 6.27 says, But he did it at night because he was still afraid. See, Gideon was scared. So what? Fear doesn't disqualify you from obedience. And you haven't actually really lived until you've obeyed God scared out of your mind a little bit, right? Because scared obedience is still obedience. Now, if you don't know the story of Gideon, the rest of the story of Gideon reads almost like a comic book. It, it defies odds. It escapes logic uh, as, as God dwindles an army that he had given Gideon. This, this army had 32,000 men in it. And God makes it more manageable and shrinks it down to 300 people. Right? And the victory in battle, it's, it's, it's almost unbelievable, right? Uh, let me share the story with you. Get this, it's a true story. Listen to this. This comes in Judges 19 through 22. 7, 19 through 22. Judges 7, 19 through 22. You see, it was just after midnight, after the changing of guard, uh, when Gideon and a hundred of his men reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly they blew the ram's horns, and they broke some clay jars. Then all three companies of, of the army also blew on their horns and they broke their jars. And then they held up aloft blazing torches in their left hand, and, and then they had and their horns in their right hand, and they all shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! And it says that each man stood in his position around camp. And you know what happened after they did all this? Their enemy, the Midianites, who far outnumbered them, they, 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 they all rushed around in a panic with their swords, chopping at one another, killing one another, crying out in, feel, in fear, freaking out. And so they managed to basically wipe each other out as an army, and the few that didn't get wiped out run off in fear. And it says, when the 300 Israelites blew the ram's horn, the Lord caused the warriors in camp to fight against one another with their swords, and those who were not killed, they fled. Without ever using a single sword, they defeat the Midianite army that far outnumbered them. But this miracle would have never, ever happened unless Gideon gets enough courage to obey what God is asking him to do. Miracles happen for the bold, for those willing to dream big, those who are willing to show up and do it scared. When Gideon thought about that battle later in his life, I can only imagine, but I, I bet he just had that, that, you know, that stupid grin you get. That's just like, I can't believe we did that. That was so dumb, but God is so good. Right? That grin that you get when you are crazy enough to trust God to plant that small seed of faith when He asks you to do something that might sound on the surface a little bit crazy but now you're standing on the other side of it as a witness to God's miraculous faithfulness. That's an amazing grin to have. So what miracle are you needing in your life? But you haven't been bold enough to take that first step yet. Are you praying for a family member or for a friend or a neighbor to be saved, but you haven't shared your faith or invited them to church yet? Are you maybe praying for God to heal your marriage, but you haven't taken that first step to seek out counseling for yourself? 
Are you holding on to a, a past hurt, a past harm from some sort of broken relationship? And you haven't offered forgiveness in that relationship because you don't want to give up control of that. And you don't want to give up control over that conflict. You don't want to give up control over that person because they hurt you and you're going to let them know for the rest of eternity, right? Maybe you're praying for freedom from addiction, but you haven't bothered to try recovery yet or to try to share your secret, dark, hidden sin with somebody you might trust. God is more than able to perform a miracle in spite of your lack of obedience, but it rarely works that way. We almost always have to take that one obedient first step and then God steps in and wins the battle folks it only takes the faith the size of a mustard seed and God can do amazing things let's pray to that God Lord God we are humbled and amazed that despite our often lack of faithfulness you choose to love And you choose to use us anyhow. God, many of us here today, we have things that we've been struggling to trust you with. Things that we either want to control or things we don't believe could happen or things that we believe are just impossible. But you are the God of the impossible. The God who leads men to walk in water. The God who raises men from the dead. The God who came to earth, lived, died, and rose again. The God of the impossible. And God, I know that is true. And I believe those stories and so many others that are beyond what I could believe if I didn't have faith. So Lord, first we start at the place of faith and just pray that that we would have faith. And in this moment, God, if there's someone here who's never put that trust and hope in you that Maybe even today, Lord, it would be the best day of the rest of their eternity that they would pause now and say, yeah, I, I, I need to know more about this God and I want to know more about this God and I want to have this God in my life. And so, so Jesus, come into my life and I put my hope and trust in you. And while I don't know all of what this means, I, I, I know that I trust you with my eternity and that I love you and I want you to be present in my life. And so I pray in this moment, God, that, that if there's someone who's not taken that step, that they would pray in this moment and say, Jesus... I've made a mess of it, and and I I have fear, and I don't know what to do, but I know you do, and so I turn my life over to you. And God, I, I trust you for my hope and for my salvation and my eternity. Free me, God, from these fears, and lead me when I am afraid. And God, for the rest of us, we're not some superstar holy people. We are just regular people, God, and we all struggle with fear at times. We all struggle with obedience. We all struggle with faithfulness. We don't always do as you call us to do. And God, I pray in this moment that if you've laid something on our hearts or if there's somewhere that we've been struggling, something that we need to do, that in this moment, God, we would commit ourselves to have that mustard seed size of faith that we might move mountains. God, Lead the way. Show us. Help us to be faithful. And as we take those scary steps, as we take those little first steps of faith, I pray that you would show up in abundant and amazing ways and that we would see miraculous things. We thank you, God, for your love. We thank you, God, for all that you have given us. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his high and holy and beautiful name that we pray.